Okay, guys, welcome to class today. Um, <clears throat> today, what I wanted to cover is some aspects of client consultation. So we're going over exercise testing and prescription, and a lot of uh, trainers out there are really good at their hard skills, meaning they're able, they understand the science, they understand how to move a client from point A to point B as far as the uh, goal is concerned. Um, they know how to take people through a workout program, but do they really know the behavioral management side? Do they really know the, the coaching psychology side of the spectrum? Um, and this is like a major factor when we initially meet our client and we go through the consult. Part of the consult is doing the fitness assessment and, and uh, doing the health history questionnaire and going over um, um, not just the health history, but the exercise preferences and um, signing a waiver form, those sorts of things. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And then um, <clears throat> I'm gonna basically go over you know, some tips of the trade for you guys. Um, as you guys saw in my bio, just a little bit of backup, I've been in the fitness industry for about 18 years now, and I've been, you know, on the teaching side of things, the, you know, uh, I've been on the management side as a director of fitness, as a program director for a university program. Um, so I've been doing this stuff for a while, and one of the things that a colleague mentioned to me one time, uh, actually... Um, kind of more like a mentor. His name's Kevin Laferrier. He actually owns this uh, business called PTA Global and Viper Fitness and PT on the Web. And he's kind of behind the scenes. But one of the things that he mentioned was that um, there's two big weaknesses that trainers have out there in the field today. And the number one is they do not know how to make their trade craft profitable. They do not know how to make really good money. And the problem is, is they go into the industry and they're like, Hey, I got a job as a trainer. This is my full-time job. Now I'm training clients, but they don't really forecast ahead to find out, Oh, okay. In one year, if I have this many clients, if I'm getting paid this much money, this is how much money I'm going to make at the end of the year. And because most of us don't do that, we find out after a year of really hard work that we didn't have the earning potential that we expected. And because of that, that's one of the main most reasons why people quit as a trainer. They stay in the industry for about 12 months and then they decide to up and quit because they didn't make enough money. You can make enough money. Okay. Um, if you are interested in hearing a little bit more about this, I can talk more about this, but it's not really the subject matter that we're going to be going into today. However, what we're wanting to do is get into teaching a group exercise class and getting people in the gym to know us really well, and then start not just training private sessions, but get into training groups training groups of people and cycling them through a circuit pattern of stations. And that's where you can teach a mixed bag of fitness goals or uh, to a results based uh, to a results based level. So what I mean by that is you got Sally who wants weight loss and Bill who wants weight gain. He wants to get buff, right? How do you train those two people? Maybe they're a married couple. How do you train them at the same time? Well, it has to do with the sets and reps that you're doing right and how you're doing that programming stimulus based on the one repetition max scheme if you're doing a resistance training program and you're putting in them through stations where they can execute the lifts that are basically focused to cause them to adapt in that particular way to hit their goals so just a really quick tidbit on that the second biggest weakness that trainers have is behavioral management they do not know how to take people from point A to point B from an attitude standpoint. We need to recognize that most people, when they come to see us, they do not have a background in their history that says, I like fitness. If you think about it, most people that you're going to rub shoulders with that love fitness that are going to the gym regularly, they have had some sort of positive experience in their background that says, I love this. This is something that I love to do. This is important to me. The clients that come to see us do not have that. They do not have that. They're thinking this is a necessary evil and um, 
you know, I do not want to be here and I have to because my doctor's making me. So that element of our inter of our interview aspect with our clients is something that we're going to touch this week. So a lot of the stuff that you're going to see on this Google document, okay, so if we take a look at the very top of the Google document, this is our this is basically our textbook and the stuff that we'll be using all the way through the course. And here's a quick link for it if you want to access or kind of make note of the quick link tiny.cc forward slash exs 145jy okay um, so that will give you access to the guide uh, or this this um, presentation document but also keep in mind if we go to our course shell it's the very first thing um, that you should see so you've got this course materials text presentation document for the course. So um, now some of you guys may be wondering, well, what about a, a textbook? Well, um, you know, I'm wanting to save you money. But uh, the other thing too is, let me go ahead and put this up. You're going to see a lot of the information that we're going to be covering in this quick video is basically going to be following along the lines of the ACSM um, resources for the personal trainer textbook fifth edition. So um, we're talking about the initial client consultation and in there we're talking about customer service and hospitality, okay, courtesy 24-hour call, be on time early for appointments, be 100% pre prepared for all appointments, those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, meet and greet the client, relationship marketing, the principle of relationship marketing here, the power of nonverbal communication, the client centered approach to coaching, rapport, building, exhibit, exhibiting empathy. We're going to talk about the difference between empathy and sympathy, active listening, okay, generating clients, fitness floor exposure, word of mouth. So that's getting in a little bit more of the marketing aspect of things. So basically, this session, even though we're following the Google document here, okay, um, I'm basically going along a lot of that stuff that's in the ACSM textbook putting a little bit more spice to it because the ACSM textbook is research-based, it's proven, it's good, but it's a little bit dry. <laughs> so we'll see if we can't make it a little bit more interesting. Um, if you want, I can go and put some of that literature that's in that textbook. I can put it on the Google document for you guys if you do not have that textbook. I recommend that you have a copy of that textbook if this is your program, if this is your, your degree that you're seeking. Um, having an ACSM certification or a NASM, NASM certification or an NSCA, National Strength and Conditioning Association, okay, the ACSM, like I mentioned before, American College of Sports Medicine, those are the two top three, okay, those are the most respected in the industry. Um, you're good to go if you have either one of those three, but um, ACSM is where we're, we're, we're pulling from. So when we get with our clients, okay, um, one of the things that I've found that I want to do is I want to be able to sit down and talk with them and really kind of get down to what can I do for you? What do you want to achieve? Okay. And um, one of the things that helps me is kind of get a little bit of a jump on that. And uh, I have found that not, instead of sitting with the client with a clipboard where you're going to see classically people doing that, if you YouTube client consult, that's what they're doing. They'll have a computer, they'll have a clipboard in front of them, kind of separates a barrier. And it might not be that the trainer is nervous about talking to the client, but they might be apprehensive about how the, inter the interview is going to go, that sort of thing. I say, check the clipboard, right? Um, what I went and did is 
made an exercise history and client intake form on Google Forms. Google Forms doesn't take very long um, to learn how to do, and the client can go and do this on their own time prior to your appointment. Okay, so you can find out a little bit about them and ask some of your pertinent questions. As you see here, training goals, how many days a week are you committed to your program? So how many days do you want to train? Have you ever broken or sprained anything? Hobbies, current occupation. So um, some of these, if you look up health history questionnaire or client intake, you can find some of some really good questions that are out there online. And you will also find some questions that you think are really, really good that you want to make sure that you ask the client. Okay. So these are some just questions that will help you get to know them. Are they going to tell you their innermost secrets on this document? No. And let me clear something up here as well that's important to know. Your clients are not going to tell you their intimate details in your first consult either. They're not going to tell you what they feel apprehensive about. They're not going to tell you what they feel embarrassed about. Most of them, 90% of them are not. Okay. <clears throat> One of the big questions that I have learned to ask, okay, so we're going here, the client has taken this, I actually have had this on my phone, it might be there in the client session, but hopefully I've read it beforehand, before meeting with the client, I got those answers on the top of my mind, and then I'm sitting down and I'm talking with them. Sometimes this client consult is going to be just before you do the fitness assessment. And in other times, it could be at a Starbucks where you're going to do the consult with them and talk with them and then set up the fitness assessment later on. So it, it just kind of depends on how your gym operates, right? But one of the things that I want to do in person interacting with the client is a couple questions. I want to find out, one, why did you come see me today? Why was today the day? You know, um, they could have come and seen me three weeks ago. They could have come to see a trainer, you know, a month from now. What was the triggering factor? What was the event, the triggering thing that brought them to come see me today? Because they actually moved through like three major barriers of resistance or obstacles to come and see a trainer, right? One, they left their house their comfortable house. They got everything there, right? They're going out into the open. You know, they're leaving their house. Two, they're going into a gym. And most of the people that come to see us for, for, for training, they're not necessarily feeling like they're killing it in the gym. That's an intimidating place for them to go to. And then three, they're coming to see a trainer whether you're nice or not nice, it doesn't matter. They're going to be putting pressure on them to represent well. So that's a major intimidation because they're going to see somebody that does not have the problem that they have, and they're going to seek help for it. So those are three big things that are major intimidations that stop people from going and seeing us. Um, and they came to see us regardless of those things. So what was it that happened? They might not tell us the first time. Now here's another key factor that's super, super important. And I might end up asking you on a questionnaire just to make sure we're watching this video. Um, one of the things uh, that you might find to your advantage when we're trying to motivate and figure out what makes our client tick, okay, is to ask them during the afterglow of the workout, okay? Um, tongue in cheek, most people when they see, when they hear the word afterglow, they're just, they're talking about something else, but I use the term afterglow of the workout because after the client has just gone and done a workout and feel like, oh, wow, I've just successfully achieved that. I feel I'm on a high because I've just gone and done something in the gym, had a good experience doing it. I've got that underneath my belt. I've achieved that for today. Not only that, but my blood is pumping. 
and uh, my endorphins are flowing, I'm feeling successful and good. And a lot of times that is the best time to sit down and chit chat with the clients casually, informal, and say, tell me how things are going. How's life? How's work? How's the family? Are you feeling like you really, do you really believe that you're going to hit these goals that you have? Tell me a little bit more about why you want to hit these goals. And then a lot of times, boom, floodwaters open up and come pouring out. And you'll hear things that they would not necessarily otherwise say because they're not necessarily feeling the way they are at that particular time. So the afterglow of the workout is a really, really good time. I've learned in the past to really get the information that we need from our clients. <clears throat> the second question, why did you come to see me today as opposed to yesterday or tomorrow? The second question is, you know, what did you like to do in high school? And just let them chit chat about high school. Some of us have had horrible experiences in high school. Some of us have had amazing experiences. Some people have been very sports orientated. Some people have been recreationally active, even though maybe not in high school. But during that time frame of their teenage years and young adulthood, what sort of things did they do with the energy that they had? I want to know what that is, because if I can associate the training somewhat towards that, that's going to help keep them motivated towards their goal. So if they ate, slept, and drank basketball when they were in high school, okay, or softball, or flag football, or whatever it was that they played, I can taper some of that. Some of my warm-ups could be throwing the pigskin. It could be, you know, shooting layups. Some of those things could be related, okay? So that's our exercise history questionnaire. So some tidbits on that. Um, use Google. You know, Google Docs, you Google Forms, okay? This is um, um, uh, personal training and waiver of release and assumption of risk. This is something that you can also send online. Um, you know, I've done a bunch of consults online with clients, and this is something that I'll send them online. You know, basically, they put their name on it, and they say, hey, I understand that sometimes people get hurt doing training, and I accept the risk. Important points on this. Make sure that you're insured, okay? So um, sometimes the gym will have its own insurance and you'll be covered under that. Let me see if I can't find the personal trainer insurance here that I, that I get. It's called Philadelphia Insurance. Here we go. And it kind of goes through the idea, you know, if you remember the idea of fitness convention is huge and that. So Philadelphia Insurance, this is good. ACSM also does their own insurance. Um, this costs about $200 to $250 a year. If you have one of those certifications, NSCA, ACSM, um, and ASM certifications, it makes it hard. It knocks a chunk of money off. Um, Clients and people in general, it, they cannot wave away their right to sue. Okay? You cannot wave away your right to sue. And let's say I... Um, um, have my client do something crazy. Let, like uh, there's this one picture. Let's see. Uh, balance ball squat. It's crazy. Um, wonder if I can find it. Oh, this right here. So, <laughs> oh, where's the one with the trainer behind him? Oh my gosh. Oh, here we go. Classic. Okay, so this is a perfect example of gross negligence right there. Um, you know, I usually precede that with saying my opinion, but this is absolutely a fact. I mean, if this person here has got 135 on his back and he's on a ball that's rated for about 300 pounds and he weighs 180 pounds, looks like there, okay, 
that ball could fail major hurtage there and you name your body part he's going to hurt okay um if the client all of a sudden loses you know the weight or starts to fall which is the trainer going to catch is he going to catch the barbell with 135 on it or is he going to catch the client right are you going to be able to curl 135 pounds there no problem I don't know too many people there that just right off the bat are going to be okay. Yeah, I'm going to curl this sucker, right? Dangerous situation. So what the court is going to do is they're going to take a look at what you did and they're going to compare it to what we call a reasonable person standard. And that reasonable person standard That reasonable person standard is going to compare it with what other trainers, professionals in the industry are doing. And if they're saying that, yeah, we don't do that, that's not safe. That's putting the client's safety at risk, okay? The courts will find you either negligent or gross negligent, and you will get guilty. You will be found guilty and sued. So keep in mind that just because clients sign a waiver doesn't relieve them of the client's right to sue. So we want to get this though. Um, I worked for a gym where a client had an accident and sued the gym and the gym had lost the waiver. And so they just got thrown to the wolves financially. It was, it was bad news for that gym. But the gym, the client had, the trainer had seen the waiver signed, handed the waiver form into administration at the front desk, and the front desk had somehow misplaced it or lost it. They had turned the whole place upside down during that lawsuit to try and find that waiver form, could not find it. I myself, I always make it a principle to photocopy the waiver if it's going to the gym, so I have my own records. And I keep those for five to seven years, or I have them sign two of them. I keep one for myself, and I keep and, and I send one to the gym if I'm training for a gym. Okay, personal training client agreement right here. Now this is also important. You could put all this stuff into one package, right? Um, but this kind of thing helps you under helps the client understand that there's some agreements going on the big one is if a client misses the no-show policy right here if a client misses an appointment and they do not give you notice 24 hours prior to the appointment they're going to get charged for that appointment they need to understand that agree to that and be aware of it ahead of time because for some of us we got to put kids in daycare right? For some of us, we have a client at 6 a.m. and then we don't have that particular client till 9 a.m. So we have that 6 a.m. client and we're waiting through the hours of 7 and 8 a.m. in the morning and then we're waiting for that client to show up at 9. They don't show up and you're playing daycare that whole time, right? You could have gone home for those couple hours, come back to the gym later on. They need to understand that for you to commit to be there, they need to commit to be there and if they need to change their schedule up they need to let you know i have charged i have charged clients a 20 uh, a, a late fee for not showing up generally my choice is i give them one mulligan so i'm like hey missed you on this day oh yeah i forgot you know did you get my text at 24 hours yeah but i forgot to respond to you oh that, that's okay um you know let's forget about that one but going forward here um, we're, we're going to respect the Nate, no late policies. Is that okay? I'm not, I don't have, not mad or anything, but I just need to get paid for the session if I'm there, if you understand. And I've never, ever had a problem with anybody or, or, or anybody feeling grudgmental or anything like that for charging them for a no show. But this is a big, but <laughs> I always text them prior, 24 hours prior to the appointment. They know, they get the text, I get the response from them. Hey, yeah, we're good to go. And they, they, they have that text, so they know. Now, if I had an appointment with somebody and they, sh and they did not show, but I did not give them a reminder text, then, you know, I, would be feeling like maybe 
not not such a nice guy if I was going to charge them for that cancellation or that no, not cancellation but no show. Does that make sense? So in order for me to uphold my late policy on no shows, I precede that with the fact that hey, you're going to get a text from me. Um, you know, just answer with a thumbs up emoticon or whatever. It doesn't have to be a conversation. Just so we're both keyed into the fact that we are meeting on that particular day for our next appointment. Okay, so that kind of helps put put this you know out there. One of the things, just a, a, a insider tri a trick that I've learned to do as a trainer. Most sessions with clients are 50 minutes, so it gives you 10 minutes of buffer time between ending that client session with that client number one and then beginning client session with number two. Right. Um, what I've learned to do is tell my client come 15 minutes early to the gym. So if our appointment starts at nine, be at the gym, dressed down, ready to go at 8.15. Here's a warm up that you can do to get our blood moving, the heart rate up, okay? Get ourselves lightly warmed up prior to our session. That way when I'm on the floor and I'm training people, I've got my eyes out there, okay, at quarter two to see if my client has walked in the door or if they're on the floor. And if they're not, that gives me an awareness of, oh, I need to text them real quick. And I've had that. I've had some clients be like, oh, man, I forgot. And they rush to the gym. They're not, they don't live too far away. And they are only maybe 10 minutes late for the session. So, you know, that's been something that's worked for me. Client intake form. So we need to be aware if there's aches or pains or medications that the clients are on. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Um, you can do a PAR-Q. PAR-Q stands for Physical Activity, Ready, Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire, P-A-R-Q. So that's a good one that you can use, right? It's very, very short, short and sweet. It's basically screening things, screening for things like diabetes, um, heart disease, um, um, you know, those sorts of contraindications to exercise and some of the ones that are, you know, precursors to it. So you can get some of these activity question is, uh, readiness questionnaires and um, that would, you know, keep you safe, you know, medically if they check one of those boxes. Uh, let's say they say they have heart disease or they've got diabetes or something like that. Then what you want to do is have them go get a physician's note. I would take the administrative side on that and say, here, you know, what doctor can I call to get you as a clearance? What's the last place that you had a physical? I would help them through that. Or you could lose the client. The client might say, oh, I didn't realize it was going to be so much red tape to train. Um, so I would help facilitate that. I would be very proactive on that. But you, if the person's got contraindications to exercise, do not train them unless you've got that medical okay from the doctor, okay, protecting yourself. All right. That being said, with the client intake stuff, okay, going back to some of our consultation here, we want to keep in mind that we want to be client-focused or client-centric. Okay, so the difference between the two, here's a trainer-centered practice. So we've got a trainer where they want the client to feel like they're dependent on the trainer. They might be intimidating. Um, they might be putting goals that are a little bit too lofty or they're trying for quick fixes. Basically, this stems back to like the 1980s and 1970s when personal training first was established. People would see these goddess, gods and goddesses of physique and they would say I want to be like that person they'd approach them and say train me I want to be like you and that person would say um, oftentimes they would say well do what I do and do what I say and you know um, follow me little Padawan and you will become likewise not true sometimes that works for folks but most of the time there's hiccups in the midst like, oh, okay, you do 500 um, push-ups every day. That's great. Doing push-ups hurts my back. Why does it hurt my back? And the trainer's thinking, doesn't hurt my back. Why should it be you hurting your back, right? 
they don't really know how to have like, you know, how to break that down necessarily, right? So not only that, but one quote from a coaching psychology manual that I love um, uh, said that the client's own argument for change is always more powerful than yours. The client's own argument for change is always more powerful than yours. So part of what you're doing in the interview is you're becoming client centric. Let me give you some examples of this, and this is gonna lead into some of your assignments later on. I'm, I intend to give you guys two assignments. One is to do a mock client interview with a partner somewhere or a warm body and put it on YouTube for me to assess. And it's just a practice, right? You're getting points for doing the assignment, not necessarily asking the most phenomenal, br phenomenal brilliant questions. You probably do the YouTube assignment and feel like it's a train wreck. Submit it anyway, I'll give you full points for doing the experience, it's experiential. That's what the points are for, not necessarily whether you slam dunk it or not. Because if you're like me, when you first just started doing client interviews, you stunk at it and felt like, oh my gosh, why did I say that? I could have done so much better had I said this, right? It's basically a skill for 90% of people out there. It's a skill that you've got to practice to get good at. There's the 10% out there that are just born at doing this. They, they love this and they're very good at it from a social aspect. Kudos for them, but for the rest of us, we've got to practice. So this client-centered approach, one of the things that I will do in the client sessions is I'll sit down and I'll forget about any agenda that I have going on in the day, anything that's going on in my personal life, anything that's going on at the gym. Hopefully this is a private setting and I'll sit down, take a breather, empty everything and say to them as I'm looking them in the eyes with a smile and eyebrows up, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And I'm genuine about it. I mean it. I want to know and I let them talk and I'm trying to ask them questions that are going to make them talk. You've got closed ended questions and open ended questions. The closed ended questions end in yes and no. Did you have a good day? Yes, no, right? So those of you guys who have kids, you might think, if I wanted to find out how my kid's day at school today was, if I asked them, how was your day at school? What's my kid going to say? Good. How could I ask him, tell me what happened at school today? I want to find out what happened before your first recess. How was math class? And tell me, you know, what you learned in math class, right? So you're going to ask open-ended questions that are going to cause that person to actually give you a detailed answer as opposed to a one-liner, right? Or if you don't have kids, maybe put your brain into the queue of, let's pretend I'm at a blind date. You're sitting across, let's say, a dinner table from your blind date. You don't even know this person. How are you going to lead into these questions, right? You, you're not going to ask yes or no questions. You're going to be asking more like, tell me about yourself. What do you love to do, right? So think of it in that sense, okay? So asking open-ended questions is important. Finding out what's important to the client and then we're asking them a little bit about their problem, or they might tell us a little bit about their problem, okay? So the problem might be, you know, classic 90% of your clients are going to be interested in weight loss. Really, that's just most of the people that come to see you are going to want weight loss. And they're going to say, oh, it's been horrible. I just can't seem to lose weight. I got exercise-induced asthma. I've got really bad knee problems. I've got... Um, um, a slow thyroid or a hypothyroid and that's the reason why I'm fat and, I, and there's nothing I can do about it the problem isn't solvable okay and we're going to talk a little bit about our attitude of empathy on this but just preceding this this is real for the client in the back of our mind as trainers we would might might be thinking well you've got exercise induced asthma you've got a slow thyroid and sore knees once we get fit particularly cardiovascular fit. And by that, I mean the person can maintain a, a jogging, leisurely jogging pace. 
unbroken for 45 minutes to an hour. Once they get to that point, it doesn't take too long to get to that point, maybe three or four weeks, okay, of running about three or four times a week. Um, once they get to that point, you don't hear those complaints anymore. They don't talk about them because they're not relevant. They're not really there anymore. Their body's not in good shape. But what about that particular moment in time? This is real. This is tragic. This is exponential. Way. I'll say, well, the problem's impossible to solve. You just told me the problem's impossible to solve. But if it wasn't, how would you go about it? Or asked another way, oh man, that must be so difficult. Well, if we were to overcome those difficulties, what do you think would be the best way to do that? What would be the best strategy? This is a brilliant question to ask, in my opinion, because that client has had months, maybe years, to think about how to solve that problem. And yet you are expected to have the solution to the universe in, what, 30 seconds of conversation? You know, uh, I want to find out what they think. Because I could say something like, well, your answer's running. Let's go get on the treadmill. Bam. Right? And that person's thinking, uh, I have low arches, my feet hurt, I hate the treadmill, my knees hurt, this is horrible, I like the elliptical way better, why did he just tell me to go to the treadmill, he's not the trainer for me, right? I don't know enough about the client to go ahead and say something necessarily like that, like a blanket statement, even though it's research proven, okay? So I want to find out what makes that client tick, what their likes and dislikes are, what their preferences are. And then I want to try and help guide the client towards their own solution for change. The client's own argument for change is always more powerful than their own. So I'm not trying to manipulate them. If I was manipulating them, I'd be trying to convince them to do something that they don't want to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help them feel really confident and motivated towards something that they feel like they can accomplish and they feel like they've got a good way forward, a good path forward to proceed with. Now, where I can help out with that is I can, I can align the research with the client's um, goals and with their, their perceived um, um, or their, their suggested approach. So that's being client-centered. We have found that a client-centered approach is much, much more effective than being the drill sergeant or authoritative type of coach. So as it says right here, patient-centered counseling approaches offer a variety of techniques by which practitioners can support clients' optimal motivation resulting in long-lasting health behavioral change. This includes aligning their natural tendencies towards growth and health with their other life goals and values. Working with clients in this manner allows them to develop a plan for regular physical activity that is best suited for their specific needs, values, strength, strengths, barriers, and life stage. Okay, so we've got a few more things here where we're talking about establishing trust and rapport, and you can read through these. Um, I won't necessarily cover or read through this in the video. You can read through this on the, in the Google Doc, but very, very good stuff. So some of these are, you know, this is motivational interviewing is actually a peer-reviewed method from sports psychology and psychology, the American Psychiatric Association which is APA, a lot of times you write your papers, APA format, it's American Psychiatric Association, but these are all peer reviewed methods of helping clients um, achieve things that are difficult to do. And they talk about some of these things. So you can read through feelings of empathy, self-efficacy, we're gonna talk about those for a second here. Establishing trust. This one right here is a big one. Holding an unconditional positive regard. An unconditional positive regard. 
What does that mean? So that means, let's say you as a student, right, are constantly submitting in assignments late and you, um, let's say you give me a phone call and you're feeling like, oh, okay, you know, Coach Young, because I've submitted, I haven't submitted a couple assignments and um, I haven't come to class a few times. I'm just throwing an example out here. The student might think, oh, Coach Young thinks I'm a slacker or whatnot. For me, as an instructor holding an unconditional positive regard, doesn't judge on that. You don't pay me to judge you, okay, as a trainer or really as a professor. My job is to take you from here to here. I want to make sure that you become successful because as a result of your educational experience, as a result of what you take you through you take yourself through in the learning process, right? I wanna make sure that when you're in the industry, you feel confident and successful and prepared to help people, right? So I'm not gonna be giving you this huge lecture or making you feel bad. I'm trying to lift you up. Same thing with your clients, right? If you show that you're disappointed at the client, um, that's really devastating for a lot of people in the general public. If you're coaching athletes, different scenario, different scenario. You can be a rough, tough, you know, strength coach, give them grief. You know, they'll still keep coming back. A lot of these athletes are very, very motivated, but the general public, they're very um, sensitive. So we, a large part of our operation with training them is this behavioral stuff. Okay, because again, they haven't had the positive experiences with athletes who are training somebody who's maybe already had a championship or they're hungry for a championship. Doesn't matter what you do to them, they're going, they're on fire for that game, for that performance, whatever, right? But these clients, they could quit any time. So we want to have, um, you know, hold a, a positive high regard for them. Okay. Now, showing empathy versus sympathy. Read this here. It's pretty good. But basically what it's saying is there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Okay? So sympathy, let's say the client comes in and they tell you that their dog died just that morning or yesterday. What? And they come in and they're all, eyes are bloodshot and bags under their eyes. You can tell they're all, you know, been crying and that sort of thing. They come to you and they, yeah, my dog died, right? A sympathetic re response would be you start crying. You start getting super upset because the dog died. That's sympathetic. Empathetic is understanding what the client must be feeling, even though, <coughs> pardon me, you're not having that emotional response. You have a genuine awareness of what that must feel like. So you're working with that client. Now this has to do with things, like I said, oh, I've got a hypothyroid, I've got you know exercise-induced asthma, I got sore knees, all this, that, and blah, 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 plantar fasciitis, and all these things, right? We need to be empathetic to the fact that that's real for the client, even though we might not necessarily be sure that that's a permanent thing, right? We need to be empathetic because for the client, that's a real thing. Couple other things as we're going through here. How do we look and how do we come across to our clients? What are our facial expressions? Okay. So we need to be aware of the big trick for me is um, recognizing, first of all, that I have a, what do they call it? A, um, <clears throat> an RBF, a resting bitch face. That's the, that's the messaging and, you know, Facebook term for it. It basically means when you're at when you're at rest, you're not necessarily upset or angry, but you have a face that looks that way, right? I need to be aware for me and a lot of us that sometimes when we're relaxed, we might look like we're not 
pleased or we're upset or, you know, we might come across as intimidating. So especially for the male trainers, we need to make sure that we've not got an RBF going on here. We want to make sure that we got, I call it cheesy grin. So we're smiling, even though we're not necessarily feeling like we need a smile right now. We want to make sure we present a smile because we want our clients to feel like they're comfortable and that we're approachable. Okay. The other thing that I think is even almost more important than the smile is the eyebrows up and the communication through the eyes. And you're going to see this in these pictures right here. We've got smiles going on that aren't necessarily working with the eyes. Okay. How we dress is also important. Depends on the gym. Some gyms, it's a spandex club going on. And, you know, some things are not important in certain places. We want to show that we're fit. We want to show, give the impression that we're, we're, you know, fit individuals and that we live and practice what we preach. In a sense, we are our own business card in that regard. With athletes, it's different. I mean, coach will come in with two boxes of pizza and the whole team will say, hey, coach just went and bought us pizza. And he'll say, get your own. This is my dinner. And he'll eat all two pizzas right there in front of everybody. You know, the big dude, right? That's, uh, that's not necessarily the, you know, there's a difference between your general public and your, uh, your athletes, right? So dress and demeanor, you know, mean, mean uh, something, right? So we can go through that, read through that. So we've got different types of coaching styles here, authoritarian or authoritarian, like I mentioned, democratic, cooperative. That's kind of more a little bit more like your client-centered approach to training, where generally it's a semi-directive. The fitness professional is responsive listener and solicits input and ideas from the participants before making any decisions. Okay. This democratic advisory is a little bit more like free gym time, kind of, in my, in my opinion. This last one here that I, I want to discuss is, is important. And um, let's see, is it the last one? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about this next week. Okay. So this one here is you know, asking questions personally, okay? So this is, you know, um, a friend of mine from the gym. This is going back a couple of years. And his name's Ralph. And Ralph would attend my spinning sessions. Like I mentioned, one of the ways to become a really good personal trainer and have lots of clients is to teach a really great group exercise class. The way to get really good at teaching the group exercise class is to attend the group exercise class. Right. So we want to we want to um, get our name out there so people know who we're who we are. And uh, that's the best way to do it. So I would teach these spinning classes. And um, Ralph was one of my um, participants, members at the gym. So Ralph would come to my um, spinning classes on a regular basis and um, he would he would really work hard. And a lot of those, you know, the spinning class that I was doing was kind of your kick butt class. It was the advanced class. People, you know, expected to get a whooping, you know, in that spinning class. And uh, Ralph was one of them. In fact, I even, you know, recommended a lot of my uh, members there get heart rate monitors, a polar heart rate monitor to monitor their calories burned and their average heart rate during the sessions. So they could be a little bit more quantifiable with their exercise. And he got that. He would always come to me at the end of these sessions and brag. And wow, who was definitely bragging rights. Within 45 to 50 minutes of spinning, he would be burning 700 calories. And uh, so I, I, one day he came to me and he's a hairy guy, right? So sweat's just, you know, coming off him like a sponge, right? And he's coming up to me. He's like, look at this, you know, and I'm like, okay, you, you're getting me wet, right? And he said, you know, 700 calories. And 
I stopped for a second and said, Ralph, tell me why you're doing this. You come to my class every single time, you know, without fail. You're, I see you in the gym crushing on the weights and you're doing great. I'm really, really impressed. Like, what is, what's your motivation? Why are you doing this? And he says, well, I want to lose weight. All right. So I took him, even though he wasn't my client. Um, we do this a lot. <laughs> Um, I sat him down and I spent about maybe 15 to 20 minutes with him explaining where his resting metabolism was at, how much he should be eating compared to resting metabolism and calories burned and physical activity and exercise. And we basically went and I showed him how much he should be eating every day in order to succeed with his weight loss goals. Because like him, he, he's like a lot of clients that go to these group exercise classes. Because if you don't keep a food log and track your progress and how many calories you burn and your physical activity, you just eat back the food that that your cal your body's burning off, and you don't lose any weight. And so anyway, I showed him what he needed to do. Two and a half months later, I'm you know on the gym floor doing like a supervisory, you know, uh, supervision shift and Ralph's there and he's, I look across the gym floor and there's like 20 people around, around Ralph and they're all cheering and clapping and, you know, patting him on the back, go Ralph and clapping. And, you know, he's standing on the scale. So when the dust settles down a little bit and people kind of, you know, leave to go do their thing and stuff after congratulating Ralph and patting him on the back and shaking his hand and everything else, I kind of come in after the scene a little bit and I uh, say, you know, Ralph, what's going on? And uh, he says to me, he says, well, um, I, this is the first time in 30 years that I've weighed under 200 pounds on the scale and I said Ralph that's great you know how many pounds did you lose and he said I've lost 25 pounds since you showed me what to do with my eating said, Ralph that's fantastic I'm, I'm thrilled way to go that's exceptional two and a half months 25 pounds you're killing it and he was I was super thrilled for him genuinely so and then he stops and he looks me in the eye. And this was after one of his workouts. So after Glow from the workout, he says, do you know why I do this? Do you know why I'm coming in here and killing it day after day in the gym, lifting weights, attending your classes, and trying to lose weight? I said, yeah, it, let, tell me. Because I, I was taken aback a little bit because I thought, well, you wanted to lose weight. Well, why did he want to lose weight? And then, as we're seeing right there, you can probably guess. He said to me, and I had no idea at the time. I'd not seen this picture before, you know, at the time. He said, I've got six of the most adorable grandkids that you've ever set your eyes upon. And I want to be here present on God's green earth for as long as absolutely possible to spend every moment I can with them. That was his motivation to be at the gym so frequently and working out so hard. I had asked him why he wanted to, why he was going to the spinning classes. He said, I want to lose weight, but he never told me why. So that story really affected me. We need to find out what really is governing the values of our particular clients when we're training them. We want to find out really what makes them tick. Sometimes they might not let us know. There are some people that love, love, love to be watched and have attention when they're working out. They love to look beautiful or they love to look buff when they're working out and they, like, well, they want people to watch. That's motivating for them. Is that bad? It's not. Is it really hurting anybody for them to get attention and to feel important? I don't think so. But would somebody admit to that? Probably not. 
flip it, flip the direction. Are they going to tell you, I hate working out in the gym when there was all these people watching me. I can't stand looking in the mirror at myself when I work out. These things are good and important information for us to be aware of. It's going to help us tailor our training to be more concise towards our client. Okay, so the next one that I want to do, and this isn't quite finished yet, um, but I'm, this is kind of pertaining to the assignment that we're going to have in the following week after this one. So we're going to have more of like a question on this particular video in the Google document about client intake. But then we're going to have a chance to do a little bit of a client intake interview. And here's some examples that you can watch. Okay, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about some administration. Um, it doesn't necessarily have be hyper focused towards um, exercise testing and prescription, but it is something that I don't think gets touched upon in any other of your exercise science classes. Like my brother, who's a doctor, he said I went through all through medical school and I never had one business class, and yet I'm now I'm graduated. And I'm supposed to open a clinic, right? So this is just a little bit about administration. It's going to be a small tidbit towards your live lecture. This one, this one will the, the next one, the next live, not live, the next recording I'm going to make is not going to be as long as this one. Thanks, guys.